Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Narayanam Namaskrityam Naram Chaiva Narottamam Devim Sarasatim Vyasam Tato Jaya Mudhirayat Nasta Prayeshu Vabhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtaki Reading Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 7, Chapter 12, entitled The Perfect Society, Four Spiritual Classes, Text Number 10. Kalpayat Vatmana Yavad Abhasam Midameshwara Dvaitam Tavanna Viramet Tato Yashya Viparyaya Kaupayat Vatmana Yavad Abhasam Midameshwara Dvaitam Tavanna Viramet Tato Yashya Viparyaya Kaupayat Vatmana Yavad Abhasam Idameshwara Dvaitam Tavanna Viramet Tato Yashya Viparyaya Kaupayatva Ascertaining positively Atmana by self-realization, self yavat, yavat, as long as, as abasam, reflection of the original body and senses, body and senses. idam, this, the body and senses, ishvara, completely independent of illusion, dvaitam, Duality, Tavat, for that long, Na, does not, Viramet, Si, Tata, by such duality, He, indeed, Ashya, of the person, Viparyaya, Counteraction. Counter Translation. As long as a living entity is not completely self realized, as long as he is not independent of the misconception of identifying with his body, which is nothing but a reflection of the original body and senses, he cannot be relieved of the conception of duality, which is epitomized by the duality between man and woman. Thus there is every chance that he will fall down because his intelligence is bewildered. Maybe you can repeat, as long as a living entity, as as a living entity is not completely self-realized, 
as long as he is not independent of the misconception of identifying with his body, which is nothing but a reflection of the original body and senses. He cannot be relieved of the conception of duality, which is epitomized by the duality between man and woman. Thus there is every chance that he will fall down because his intelligence is bewildered. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Here is another important warning that a man must save himself from attraction to women. Unless one is self-realized, fully independent of the illusory conception of the material body, the duality of man and woman must undoubtedly continue. But when one is actually self-realized, this distinction ceases. Vidyavinaya sampani brahmane gavi hastini shuni chai vashvapaki cha pandita samadarshana. The humble sage, by virtue of true knowledge, sees with equal vision a learned and gentle brahmana, a cow an elephant, a dog, and a dog-eater outcast. On the spiritual platform, the learned person not only gives up the duality of man and woman, but also gives up the duality of man and animal. This is a test of self-realization. One must realize perfectly that the living being is spirit soul but is tasting various types of material bodies. One may theoretically understand this, but when one has practical realization, then he actually becomes a pundit, one who knows. Until that time, the duality continues, and the, and the conception of man and woman also continues. In this stage, one should be extremely careful about mixing with woman. No one should think himself perfect and forget the Shastric injunction that one should be very careful about associating even with his daughter, mother, or sister, not to speak of other women. Srila Madhvacharya cites the following slokas in this regard. Bahutvanaiva vastunam yatarta jnana mucchate advaita jnana mitieta advaita jnanam tad anyata yata jnanam tata vastu yata vastus tata mati naiva jnanarta yor vedas tata ekatva vedanam Unity in variety is real knowledge, and therefore giving up variety artificially does not reflect perfect knowledge of monism. According to the Achintya Bed Abeda philosophy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, there are varieties, but all of them constitute one unit. Such knowledge is knowledge of perfect oneness. Om Magyana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Nama Vanchakaupatarubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Hadvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadigor Bhaktavinda 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So the seventh canto began with Sukadeva Goswami replying to questions put by Maharaj Parikshit that he wanted to know, first of all, about how the Lord is actually equal to everyone when he appears to be partial. And then secondly, he wanted to know also about how Sishupal became qualified for liberation back to the spiritual world. So this led to Sukadeva Goswami narrating the pastime of the appearance of Lord Nishringadev and he went on to describe the wonderful qualities of Prahlad Maharaj. And hearing all the wonderful qualities of Prahlad Maharaj, then Maharaj Parikshit was inspired to know how he could cultivate all of these wonderful qualities. And this led to Sukadeva Goswami describing to us about the Vedic system of Varnashram Dharma. And he described in the previous chapter the four different varnas and how they should be executed properly. And now in this chapter, he's describing about the different ashrams. And he's been describing particularly about brahmacharya and sannyasis. And naturally, brahmacharya and sannyasis, they're vowed to restrict their association with the opposite sex. So here in this verse, so it's, point, it's pointed out that one should not make any duality. In other words, we should see men and women equally without making distinction. This is the transcendental platform. Prabhupada in the purport quotes the verse from the Bhagavad Gita, which is uh, the p vision of Paramatma, seeing the soul within everyone. Not only people equally, but seeing also the animals equal to people, seeing all living entities. Remember Srila Prabhupada going to Australia and the devotees arranged a program for him where he went to a, uh, a monastery of uh, monks who were following St. Francis of Assisi. So the monks there were also vegetarian, or at least, and they were telling Srila Prabhupada how St. Francis used to address the trees and the plants and the flowers, as used to address the trees and the plants and the flowers as brothers and sisters. And when Prabhupada heard this, he said, oh, this is real God consciousness. So they were very happy to hear Srila Prabhupada appreciate the high level of realization of St. Francis. The same point is encouraged here that we have to come to the higher platform and try to be above the bodily conception of life. Of course, it's uh, a difficult thing to do. Uh, Prabhupada, in the end of the purport here, is talking about the real monism. What is actual monism, real oneness? We often discuss that statement which Srila Prabhupada said that we should come every year to Mayapur and the leaders should discuss how to create unity in diversity. So again, unity, oneness, you see, the, the, the same point is here, monism, oneness, but it doesn't mean that we are, that ultimately everything is one. There's one, but there is also difference. Srila Prabhupada says, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has given us the philosophy of Achintya Ved Abeda Tattva. 
inconceivably, simultaneously, one and at the same time different. So while we see a oneness, we also have to see a difference. Hmm? And Prabhupada talks about the epitome of this duality comes in the men and women. The people are very much in the bodily platform and men are naturally attracted to women. Women have an attraction to men. There's n this natural affinity towards opposite sexes. But we have to come, however, we have to transcend that, come to the higher platform of seeing everyone as spirit soul. We are encouraged to address all women, to see all women as mother, right? A learned person is one who sees all women as mother. Ch Prabhupada would often quote Chanakya Pandit who had said like this, so it's seeing all women as mother, that's also a, a very uncommon in the modern society. People don't have quite that mood. We have to come to the transcendental platform trying to overcome the urges of the body, seeing everyone in relation to Krishna. In the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, there's a couple of interesting examples where Lord Chaitanya had, to, well, had some involvement with women. One was, uh, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was coming to the temple of Lord Jagannath, he heard the voice of someone singing the Gita Govinda, Jayadeva Goswami's Gita Govinda. And they were singing in a very, very beautiful voice, very attractive voice. And when Lord Chaitanya heard the words of the Gita Govinda, then it awakened his natural love for Krishna. And he began to run towards that person without even considering who was singing. Now, it was actually a young woman who was singing. But he heard the voice and he heard the words of Jayadeva Goswami's Gita Govinda. And in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it writes that these, these, this song of Gita Govinda attracts the whole world. You, even, you hear it even you don't understand it. It's so wonderful, it's so powerful, so amazing. So Lord Chaitanya, who could understand fully the meaning and relish everything, because it's Gita Govinda is all about Radha's and Krishna's separation. So it awakened his love for Lord Krishna and he began to run towards that person singing. And he began to run, even though there were thorny bushes on the path, and these thorns were pricking his body, but it did not stop him from running towards his voice. Govinda, however, Govinda is the personal servant of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, was witnessing, and he saw what was happening, and he ran after Lord Chaitanya. And he managed to just grab Lord Chaitanya just before Lord Chaitanya had reached the place where this, the singing was coming from. And Govinda grabbed Lord Chaitanya and said to him, it's a woman singing. And then when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu heard the word woman, then he returned to external consciousness. He had been on, in transcendental consciousness. But when Govinda told him it was a woman singing, then he came to material consciousness. And he turned to Govinda and he told Govinda, you have saved me. I am so much indebted to you. He said, if I had gone to the woman and embraced the woman, I would never be able to continue my life. So like this, Lord Chaitanya expressed his appreciation to Govinda and he asked Govinda, he said, please always stay with me because there is danger everywhere. 
If you will always stay with me, then you can protect me from all of the danger. So that was one incident which Lord Chaitanya described something of his uh, feeling. And then there's another incident, however, which came when Lord Chaitanya was standing in the Jagannath temple and Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu used to stand at the bottom of the Garuda Stamba. Now, of course, I'm not able to go into Lord Jagannath temple, but from the descriptions in Chaitanya Charitamrita, we're told something, how there's a Garuda Stamba at the back, and then there were throngs of people all having darshan of Lord Jagannath, Baladev and Subhadra. So it was very difficult. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, of course, was very tall. He could stand at the back, at the, at the side of Garuda Stabha, and he could have darshan of Lord Jagannath. And indeed, he was seeing Lord Jagannath as being non-different from Lord Krishna, the son of Nanda Maharaj. He was not just seeing Lord Jagannath, but he was seeing Lord Krishna. And he was seeing Lord Krishna everywhere. However, it happened that suddenly an elderly arisen lady appeared. And she began to climb up the Garuda Stamba. And she stepped onto the shoulder of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Now, actually, there were two offenses here. Because the Garuda Stamba is part of the body of Garuda. And Garuda is a great devotee of the Lord. We should not touch any devotee with our feet. So she was committing an offense against Garuda by climbing up the Garuda Stamba. And then she was committing an offense against the Supreme Lord, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself, because she was she put her feet onto his shoulder. And then when Govinda, Lord Chaitanya's servant, when he saw this, then he thought, oh, what, so offensive. And he got her down, brought her down. And when she came down, then she understood her mistake and she fell at the feet of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and begged forgiveness for her offense. However, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did not take any offense. Rather, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu chastised Govinda. And he called him an Adivashya, meaning Prabhupada translates it as an uncivilized person or like an aborigine. Actually, it seemed Lord Chaitanya used this word Adivashya to Govinda. There's another instance also where Lord Chaitanya called him. Just like Prabhupada would sometimes say to us, rascal, like that, you know. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu used this Adivashya. And uh, he was saying to Govinda that, why are you disturbing this woman that she's so eager to see Lord Jagannath? I wish I had that same eagerness to see Lord Jagannath. That she's so eager that she climbs up just to see the Lord. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did not take any offense at all against that lady for her enthusiasm to have darshan of Lord Jagannath. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu rather prayed that I wish she will give me mercy that I will develop the same enthusiasm to see Lord Jagannath. So this is, a, you can see some difference there, how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is responding to this situation. So there's of course, then Chaitanya Charitamrita goes on to describe how initially Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was seeing Lord Krishna as Jagannath. But when the lady climbed on his shoulders, then he, he was not able to see Krishna anymore. Instead, his, trans, his, his 
his, his vision of Lord Krishna everywhere was taken because a woman was there with him on, the sh on his shoulder and instead he saw the deities again. He saw Lord Jagannath in his actual form as Jagannath with the deities Baladev and Subhadra. And Lord Chaitanya is described as saying, Oh, what happened to Vrindavan? I have come to Kurukshetra. This is Kurukshetra now because in Kurukshetra, it's there in Kurukshetra that Lord Jagannath appears. But in Vrindavan, it's Shamsundar Krishna. So Lord Chaitanya was revealing the effect of the association of the opposite sex. We know that Lord Krishna performed his pastimes with the gopis in Krishna Leela. And when the gopis all came there to Kurukshetra, it was very difficult for them to associate with Krishna. Krishna rarely had, the, the gopis only with great difficulty could get the association of Lord Krishna. Because society was so rigid, so conservative, that men and young men and women were not allowed to associate together freely. So we see within our own society also sometimes there's similar concerns. Like one time the men were saying that they wanted to chant Japa in one room. They wanted the women to go out of the temple room, go some other place and chant Japa. They didn't want the women chanting in the same. But Prabhupada was not so encouraged by this. He said, well, women are everywhere. If you, you can't get away from women, it's not going to help you. You, know, you. you have to learn to control the mind. So this is a position that, which we are all in. That we have material bodies, we have to transcend the material body. We have to come to the higher consciousness. And of course, the way in which we do that is by enga engaging ourselves fully in devotional service. When we keep ourselves fully engaged in devotional service, then Maya cannot touch us. The influence of Maya comes when we are thinking, I am the body. And when we think I am the body, we identify with our bodily designation. We're thinking I'm a man or I'm a woman. We're thinking like that, how to enjoy the senses. And the greatest sense pleasure comes through the opposite sex. Therefore, association has to be controlled. Has to, there has to be some restriction. Of course, modern society, they don't like these kind of restrictions. But Prabhupada said, we read, I think in the verse yesterday, I said, people don't like these kind of restrictions, then they're animal. This is the difference between human civilization and animal civilization. In human civilization, there are more rules and regulations. The more there are rules and regulations, the more we follow them, the more we become civilized and cultured. People don't like it. That means they don't like to be civilized. When we don't want to be civilized, how can we ever progress in our Krishna consciousness? Krishna consciousness is meant to give us the highest level of civilization, the highest culture. So there has to be some kind of control, some kind of regulation there. Srila Prabhupada, of course, uh, at one point he was, did not think women would join the Krishna consciousness movement. But he saw that young women also came and also were eager for doing devotional service. And he saw how ladies could also preach just like men. And one of the, Prabhupada describes one of the reasons why he was successful, whereas some of his god brothers had not been very successful, was because Prabhupada had allowed both young men and young women to be together in practicing Krishna consciousness. 
and Prabhupada describes, he said, this is the nature of the modern society, that men and women are accustomed to mix freely together. However, in Krishna consciousness, we have to be very careful. We should associate together only as much as absolutely necessary. We don't want to ever put ourselves into a difficult situation. Prabhupada quotes Chanakya Pandit about how one should never be alone with a woman, even if it's one's mother or sister or daughter. So that is the point. You should never be alone. You should always have somebody with you. Association is therefore very important. So we have the association in Krishna consciousness. In our Krishna consciousness movement, we always hear about the importance of association. Being in the association of devotees means the men associate with other men and ladies associate with ladies. Like that. Sometimes there will be need for interaction between men and women, but that is also cautiously done. We have to deal carefully with the opposite sex. We have just heard previous verse, it was described, fire and butter, right? The woman is described to be, well, the opposite sex is like fire and we are like the butter. So Prabhupada said, the brahmacharis should have stamped on their forehead, keep in a cool place. Right? Keep in a cool place. Put, just like you have butter, you keep it in the fridge. It won't melt. So the same way, we keep the brahmacharis and the sannyasis away from the opposite sex. Hmm? Then your the mind is calm, the mind is cool. Of course, sometimes there will be disturbances. We have to find our natural position. What kind of condition are we comfortable in? Therefore, householder life is there, that people who want to be in the association of the opposite sex, then they, they are married. So dealing is, proper dealings are there. This is Vaishnava etiquette, living together in Krishna consciousness, working together to develop our Krishna consciousness. Women also have done wonderful service for the Krishna consciousness movement. We see, for example, how women, uh, it was a lady, Govinda Dasi, who introduced Tausi, the worship of Tausi Devi. Prabhupada gave her the credit of in introducing the worship of Tausi in the Western society. She had been given seats by Prabhupada and she cultivated them and she mastered the art of growing Tausi and caring for Tausi. So this was, you know, nice service done by women. Ladies also have been very wonderful book distributors and Prabhupada appreciated that, how the ladies could go out and distribute books. That was of course a very important service in Srila Prabhupada's time. So, as far as preaching, women also preach. Women also give very nice lectures. There's one letter I was just reading. Prabhupada wrote to, I think it was Brahmananda, and they were asking about women giving class, and said, Prabhupada said, yes, if women know the philosophy, they can also give class. But he said, if a man knows the philosophy as well as a woman, then let the man give the class. Right? So, oneness, but also there's some difference. I remember uh, going to New York Temple, the one lady was giving, Her Grace Jadarani Mataji was giving classes. Her classes were very wonderful because she was so knowledgeable of the scriptures very, very learned person, so she could give classes better than practically any of the men in the temple at that time. So she was regularly
preaching to all the devotees. And so we see both men and women playing their part in the Krishna consciousness movement. It's not that we discriminate against women. Women also have, sometimes people claim that we discriminate against people. They say, why don't we let people go on the altar? They say, why you have to be a brahmana to go on the altar? Someone was arguing with me one time. He said, why I have to be initiated twice before I can go on the altar and touch the deities? No, there's some discrimination. Then, yeah, because purity is there. We require certain levels, certain standards of purity. And that should be observed. Therefore, there is some discrimination. Just like we don't let like dogs come in the temple. And we keep the monkeys out of the temple. Why? They're also spirit souls. Why is there this discrimination? Because there, there is some difference also. That it is difficult for monkeys and dogs and other creatures to observe any levels of cleanliness. Therefore, we don't allow them into the temple. But, at the same time, we also do try to give them some Krishna consciousness. We distribute prasadam. Even the dogs will be fed. And the cows are also fed. And monkeys, well, <laughs> we don't like to feed them, but <laughs> usually they get fed one way or another. So that we have to learn how to practically apply this oneness in terms of Krishna consciousness. Giving everyone, every living entity, the opportunity to become Krishna conscious, to do service for Krishna. However, our preaching is particularly directed towards human beings. And we're looking for the more in inquisitive people to, to give Krishna consciousness to. Just like the Madhyam Adhikari, the preacher, he makes some discrimination. He sees there, there are people who are atheistic and envious and blasphemous. So a Krishna conscious devotee will not waste time trying to preach to such a person. Because such a person will simply become more offensive. He will commit more offenses. So we avoid those people who are atheistic or uh, offensive, blasphemers. We will avoid them. Rather, we look for those who are inquisitive, who are willing to hear. And we want to give our association to them. Because they are ready for Krishna consciousness. We don't want to lose that opportunity. So discrimination, yes, yeah, discrimination so that we can do more service for Krishna. This is practical discrimination. We're not losing the sense of oneness. We still see oneness there in everyone. We understand everyone is spirit soul. Just like when we go in Sankirtan, the Harinam party goes and chants. Even though everyone may be atheistic, they may be blasphemers, but we can go and chant the holy name, even purifies them. We give the holy name and we distribute prasadam. Anyone who wants a nation there, we give that opportunity to everyone. This, we don't make any discrimination there. We give that opportunity to everyone. This is oneness, oneness in Krishna consciousness, not oneness as the Mayavadis claim, that we're all Brahman, we're all God, we're all one. Not their idea of oneness, that Sayuja Mukti. That is simply hellish. They do not recognize that there's any Supreme Lord. So the devotees understand there's oneness, at the same time there's difference. There's the Supreme Lord and we are all his servants. Ekala Ishwara Krishna or Sabrijya. 
one supreme controller, all others are his servants. This is oneness, oneness in variety. We will stop, we will ask if there's any questions, comments. How to come to the Uttama Adhikari level? You're asking? Come down from the Uttama Adhikari stage to preach. Well, in Nectar of Instruction, Srila Prabhupada describes that the Uttama Adhikari is one who is thinking constantly how to spread the message of Krishna everywhere. Right? Now, coming down to the Madhyam Adhikari, the Madhyam Adhikari is going to make some distinction about who he's going to preach to. He won't try to give Krishna consciousness where people are blasphemers or offensive. Just like one time in Los Angeles, the devotees arranged a program for Srila Prabhupada at a vegetarian society. Srila Prabhupada said, no, I don't want to go. He said, I'm not interested to preach to a vegetarian society. I want to preach to people who are interested in Krishna consciousness. My business is to give Krishna, not to teach, not to talk to people about being vegetarian. So like that. This is Uttama Adhikar. This is coming down to the Madhyam level. You make distinction where you're going to give Krishna consciousness to. Uttama Adhikaris also generally, they don't preach because they see that everybody is already Krishna conscious. Although Srila Prabhupada, I quoted that from Nectar of Instruction, that Srila Prabhupada said, Uttama Adhikari is one who's always thinking how to give Krishna consciousness everywhere. But generally, an Uttama Adhikari is one who is not going to preach. He's simply engaging in bhajan, because he thinks everyone else is already serving Krishna. There's no need to preach. But Madhyam Adhikari thinks there is a need to preach. But he's, he makes distinction about where and whom he's going to preach to. Hmm. Preach to Prabhu. As far as making distinction, <coughs> there is a nice story. When Prabhupada came to Amsterdam in 1974, uh, he arranged a program for him. There was nobody there, almost in pain. So he went on downstairs. Thousands and thousands of hippies were there. And he invited them all in. They all came. So this time they had cut some long hair, some It was a, a good mixture of acid freaks and method free monsters and pervers. And so Prabhupada, he came, he started chanting, Jayarat Mahatma, you know, for respect to the human crowd. And when the Kirtan was finished, he started laughing. He said to Han Yuta, he said, uh, you should just say Kirtan and give him the sound. He speaks like Jesus. And he got up and left. <laughs> so he could understand that they couldn't take anything in. It was no use for him to waste his precious time. But he told us, you give them the sad, you give them care. And so in the future, they may be ready to, to listen. So it's a very fine way of trying to express this action. This action, he got up and he said, no use. You feed them the sad, and they get the time to share. Yeah, similarly, one time in Berkeley, Prabhupada was lecturing 
and some one hippie in the audience was disturbing, constantly disturbing Prabhupada's lecture. And then Prabhupada asked, immediately said, bring him prasadam. <laughs> and as soon as he got prasadam, then the man became quiet, he didn't disturb the class anymore. So this was Prabhupada's way of dealing with these kind of people. Yeah, Prabhupada was very careful about how he used his time. He wouldn't waste time. I remember another time in London, we had a program, it was arranged, one man actually wanted to do a Bhagavat Sapta in a region in London where there was a lot of Indians living, a lot of Hindus there. So Prabhupada came the first night, did the lecture, and after that he said, I'm not going to go there again. He ordered his sannyasi, there was another sannyasi resident in London, Revati Nandan, at that time Swami, told him, you go, you go and give the lecture. Prabhupada just didn't feel it necessary for him to waste his time going there every night. He said the hall was not nice and there, were not big, there was not a very submissive audience. So Prabhupada was very careful in using this. In, the, in our temples it's a different thing. Prabhupada was very eager to give classes and lectures in our centers. But going out, Prabhupada, was, he would make some distinction. Not just go anywhere and everywhere. He wanted there should be some result. We're going there preaching. There should be some effect. People should be influenced. They should be eager to hear. Yeah, that can sometimes be a problem. I remember uh, one devotee who was a leading book distributor, he would only approach men to sell books. But you, get, you do get young men who go out on book distribution, they only approach women. You know, that can be a problem. Uh, sometimes, of course, they do very well, but they don't do very well for very long if they have the habit of only approaching women, it's not going to be very long before they have some difficulties or before they give up book distribution. So, distributing Srila Prabhupada's books, we have to come to that transcendental level. You have to be pr constantly taking shelter of Krishna and praying to Krishna to guide you, to give you the intelligence to approach this sincere person. So you approach young women and you, you have to be careful not to joke with them or be frivolous with them, to deal with them very carefully and don't spend too much time with them. You don't want to have a long conversation, right? Generally, when you're selling books, it's done quickly, right? A few lines and they're going to buy the book or not. Not that you have to spend a long time having a long conversation with them. So, yeah, like that, you have to be intelligent how to use your, t how to... And also, it's good if you can have association. Generally, we go alone. I see other people, other missionary groups who go out preaching, usually they don't go alone. They will go twos or even more than two. But it's much better for a man who is distributing book if he can have another man with him. And then it's not such a problem to meet the opposite sex or to, to deal with them. In the same way two ladies can also go but you go on your own, very difficult, it can be dangerous. So association, always keep association and that can protect us.
Okay. Any other question? Prabhu? Men cannot worship the women, women, women. women worship the deities in America. Uh -huh. But in India they cannot. Well, because in India, you know that it's conservative, more conservative than in the West. People have some culture here. Generally, you know, worship the deity, you should not wear sewn cloth. Women cannot do that. Women have cl sewn cloth. You know, for men, it's easy. You just wrap a chadar around. They can do it. And so to follow all the rules and regulations, you know, it's e for the men. Usually it's the men who worship the deity. But f in Western countries, the women are allowed to do these things. Yeah, Prabhupada. There are some centers where, you know, it's Big centers like Vrindavan, Mayapur, so on, is men, but there are smaller temples, you'll see women also worshipping the deity. And smaller temples where there's not so many devotees, then the women are given that opportunity to do that service. So, yeah, outside of India, where you have uh, maybe not so many men, then the opportunity is available more for the women to worship the deities. The deity worship, Prabhupada certainly allowed women to worship the deities. I was in Kaukara and Naraini Mataji was worshipping the deities, Prabhupada was coming. You can see letters Prabhupada wrote to Yamuna telling her how nice she was dressing the deities. He was appreciating how she dressed the deities. So Prabhupada certainly expected women to worship the deities, but he knew, also understood places like Vrindavan, Mayapur, some of these places, you know, there's a stronger influence from the uh, pundits and the you know, other temples that they only have men, usually. So where it's possible, like that, you have a lot of men, then the men can do the deity worship. Women also help in the background, like at Mayapur, just like vases on the altar and garlands and different things like that are all done by the ladies. Cooking is also often done by ladies. Just only the offering of arti. It looks better to have men on the altar. Prithu Prabhu will say something about this. Okay, Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Gaur Premanandi.